If you have your Bible, you're going to turn to Galatians, Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, and hopefully you'll, you'll get this memorized by the end of this series, but it's where we start every, every Sunday in the series, um, and we're going to start there again and read about the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, those are small books in the New Testament. Paul wrote all of them. The way I remembered it was General Electric Power Company. Uh, so Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Um, and if you don't have a Bible, it's, it, there's a, one in the pew rack in front of you, and the page number is listed in the bulletin. But Galatians 5, 22 through 23 says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. And when you see that but there, that means that he was talking about something else, and now he's contrasting. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now, you know what we don't like as a people uh, in general? Uh, we don't like interruptions. Interruptions, they, they can be, they're annoying, they can be time-consuming, they keep us from doing what we want to do, they, they throw us off of our rhythm, and they are very rarely ever convenient. I mean, it's one thing to be interrupted when, when we have free time or nothing's really going on. So I guess if, if we're not really doing anything, then it's, then it's not, you know, it's not really an interruption. But, but how often does that happen? In today's world, how often are we just sitting around doing nothing? Now, my wife would say that's my reality all the time. But for, for most other human beings, and she's probably right, interruptions, they're, they're annoying. And this morning, we're, gonna, we're talking about kindness. Now, we're, we're in the series, as I said earlier, on the fruit of the Spirit. And we talked about love. We talked about joy and peace, patience, by the way. How was your patience this past week? Um, and now we've arrived right here at kindness. Now, some of you are probably thinking, why do we need a whole sermon on kindness? We get it. Help the old lady across the street. Leave a good tip at the restaurant today at lunch. Be nice to police officers. Clean up after yourself. Don't kick the dog. No problem. We got it, Jimmy. Now, let, let's, let's just go. But I would submit to you this, that kindness is so much more than just being nice. You see, biblical kindness is way more. Biblical kindness means doing what Jesus would do if he were present in your situation. It means that we are acting as though Christ himself were acting in and through us. So the questions come to mind, if, if I were Christ, what would I do for that other person? What would Jesus do in this situation? If I'm acting in the name of Jesus, what should I do? But there's, there's another side to kind of, so it's not just what would Jesus do, but there's another side to this that we have to think about. We should ask those questions, what would Jesus do in this situation, and not only ask, but act as if the other person were Jesus. Okay, not that not that, that means that you would worship them or, or bow down before them, but Whatever I'm doing to or for the other person, I am doing to or for Christ. We get those ideas from Colossians chapter 3 and, and verse 17. This isn't on the screen or anything, but it says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to, the God, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That phrase, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, means that, if, that I'm doing something that he would do if he were present right here. And then later on in chapter 3, verse 23, it says, Whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. And that phrase, as working for the Lord, means acting as if the other person you are dealing with is, is Jesus, like that you're working for that person. So when thinking about kindness, we, we have to ask ourselves the two questions. What would I do for people if, if Jesus was in me, if I, were, if I were Christ, how would I handle this? What would Jesus do? And what would I do for people if they, they were Christ? And John Stott, you, you look at him, he wrote a powerful sermon on, on both of those, those two very questions. But, but back, to the, back to the interruptions. It may be just me, but I find my kindness most tested when I face interruptions. And here's how I'll define interruption. When someone or something is keeping me from doing what I want to do or I need to do. That can test my kindness and it can test my patience. But I don't think that's just me. I think if we were all honest today, we, we don't feel like being kind when we're interrupted. 
A practical application for kindness is how we treat others, how our atti- what our attitudes are like when we face interruptions. And who interrupts you? Who interrupts you? Your spouse, uh, your kids, uh, family members, boss, coworkers, friends, strangers, homeless person on the side, so someone who's stranded on the, on, on the side of the road. And, and it's not just who, but what. Uh, sometimes job loss, illness, change of plans, relationship change, financial strain, stress, unexpected life circumstances. All of those things can be interruptions. And who and what can tell us, can test us when it comes to our kindness? Interruptions are, mer- or interruptions are very rarely met with, what would Jesus do? Or, or how can I treat that person like Jesus? So how do you build then a life of kindness? How does, how does kindness just become a part of who you are? And I want to give you four, four quick steps to help you uh, as you, we try to make kindness a, a reality in our life. And this is in your outline there. It's, it's kind of the shape of a house. I just tried to change things up for you and um, make it a little crazy. But here we go. The first one is this. The foundation for it all is God's kindness towards us. God's kind, that's, that's the foundation of our kindness as, as we build this house together. It's God's kindness towards us. Jesus was the greatest, most complete picture of kindness that we'll ever know. Ephesians 2, 4 through 7 says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Okay, talk about interruptions. Sin was the ultimate interruption. Our sin is the ultimate interruption in God's divine plan for our lives. But how did God, how did God respond to that interruption? How did he respond? How does he respond to our interruptions of sin? The Bible just told us that because of his rich mercy and his great love, he made us alive in Christ, even though we were dead in our sin, dead in our trespasses. God's ultimate expression of kindness was Jesus, Jesus on the cross. Titus 3, 4 through 5 says, but when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not Get this, not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing and regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. You see, God saved us. Why? Because of his kindness and his love for us. You notice those words kind of are always together, kindness, loving kindness. It was because of his kindness. Our sin required, required death. It required our death. Our eternal death, eternal separation from God, that was, that was the price. But because of God's kindness, he didn't, he didn't come at you and he didn't come at me with the full force of his wrath and anger like he, he could have or, or maybe even like he should have. He didn't come at us with the full force of his wrath and anger, but he came at you and me with the full force of his love and his kindness, his grace, his mercy. He unleashed his wrath on his son, the full force of his wrath on his son, so that you and I could be saved, so that we could be made new, so that we could be reconciled to him. Thank you, God, for your kindness. Thank you, God, for Jesus. And it's that kindness, that, that's the foundation for, for who we are and what we are to do. And I've said this before, but, but I love it that God always goes first. He always goes first. We're called to be kind, and it's a result of a life that was given over to Christ, right? That's a fruit of the Spirit. It comes out. But God always blazes the trail. He sets the pace. He makes the path so we can follow Him. So we, our kindness comes from the foundation that was built by God because of His loving kindness towards us. So we build on the, fa- so the next number two is we build on the foundation of Jesus' kindness by having a new mindset, Okay, that's one of the walls there that we're building on. We have a new mindset. Now I want to show you a, a quick video clip.
I love that movie, by the way. That's my fa- one of my favorite movies. If you've never seen that movie, you're missing out. So as soon as church is over, leave here and go get that movie and watch it. Uh, that scene's hilarious because he is completely oblivious to the two other amigos, his buddies. They're in the middle of the desert with nothing to drink, and he just showers himself with water, and then he offers them chapstick, lip balm. And we, we laugh at that, but guess what? We're all guilty of looking out for number one and being oblivious to what's going on around us. Actually, maybe instead of, of oblivious, that maybe a more appropriate word is, is we're maybe ignoring all the things that are going on around us. And why would we ignore, why would we ignore others? Because of, it's an interruption. That's why. It's an interruption. If we, if we look up, then we may realize that, that something needs to be done. Someone, someone may need us. Something might be required of us. So it's better to act like that you don't notice what's going on. We would rather just look after ourselves. It's easier that way. Besides, we've, you've got, I've got, we've all got important things going on in our lives. You know, who has time for kindness? Especially kindness that's going to interrupt what we've got going on. But that's the exact opposite of what biblical kindness is. We have to look at our world very differently. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. So this different for the believer means that we are no longer the center of our world. And that's very much opposite of our sin nature. It's opposite of what our sin nature would tell us. Our flesh says that you do you. You take care of you. You, you, don't, you don't have the time. You don't have the resources. Someone else, someone else will handle that. You shouldn't have to do that because your life is already hard enough. You've already got too much stress. You've already got too much going on. Those people don't deserve your kindness anyway because uh, you, you know their attitudes. And just, just focus on you. But you saw what Jesus did. Though he was rich, okay, though he, he was in heaven, okay, where it's perfect, but yet for our sakes, for our benefit, he became poor. He was thinking about us. Kindness means you're okay with others benefiting. Kindness means you'll do whatever is necessary, even if it's inconvenient or interrupts what you've got going on. Philippians 2, 3 through 4 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, in humility value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. You see, biblical kindness means you give even though someone cannot give back to you. It means you behave towards others as God behaves towards you. It means giving even though, you don't, even though they don't deserve it. It means giving even though no one says thank you. You see, the opposite of kindness, the opposite of the fruit of the, uh, the, fruit, of the, the, fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, sorry, I'm, I'm stuck, fruit, 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 fruit of the Spirit is a life that's focusing solely on gratifying the desires of the flesh. If, if you're not kind, then guess what? You're not worried about others. You're not worried about the interests, their needs, their hurts, their burdens. Those are their problems. Those are their problems. They're not yours. Your only interest in others, sometimes if you're not kind, is how it can benefit you. You see, Jesus came to give us new life, and with that new life comes this new mindset that we're talking about, a new purpose. Our lives were never meant, never meant to be lived for ourselves. That's, that's not what we were created for. We weren't created to just care about ourselves. It's like taking, taking a hammer and trying to eat a salad with it, okay? Not gonna work too well. Why? Because the hammer was never meant to be used as a utensil for eating things. It was meant to hammer things. So when, when we take our lives, we take our lives and we just live them for ourselves and we become the center of our world and all we think about us, it's like, it's like trying to... Trying to use a hammer to eat a salad, it, it, it doesn't work. It wasn't meant to be that way. We weren't, we weren't meant to, to just live for ourselves. We're called to kindness, and that means looking out for the interests of others. 
Third thing there, we build on the foundation of Jesus' kindness, knowing that action is required. That's our next one, that action is required. Kindness is not just having good thoughts for someone. It means being willing to do something or take some action that helps somebody else, even if it might be inconvenient or it might be an interruption to your agenda. Kindness means doing something that you don't have to do, but you choose to do. Did you get that? Kindness means something that you don't have to do it, but you choose to do it. And yes, it will probably cost you something. It'll cost you time. It'll cost you comfort. It'll cost you some resources, maybe even. In the Bible, kindness is often linked with generosity. It's generously providing for another person's benefit, action. A great example of, of the generosity was generosity that you guys showed towards, uh, towards Houston Northwest Church last week. And if you don't know, Houston Northwest is a church that we've kind of partnered with, and they're doing a great work down in, in, in areas that, that are affected by flood. All, all what they're doing is they, they are just going out, and they're caring for their neighbors and loving on their neighbors and, and getting, getting their neighbors help. But last week, we took a trailer full of supplies on Thursday. The trailer was full uh, of just stuff that, that they've requested that they are giving out. I talked to Steve, and we were there, and, and, and the people who are helping, and trucks come in with supplies, and guess what? They're out. We went, when we went there on Thursday, the, the parking lot was empty, but one of the ladies there uh, on staff, she said yesterday that this, this parking lot was filled with stuff, but people come and get it. So we took the trailer full of supplies. Along with that, we, we took $2,000 worth of gift cards and a check for over $10,000. And that was all because of your generosity. That was because of your kindness. You were giving to people who weren't going to give back to you, who wouldn't know who you were to thank you. Why? Why did you do that? Because kindness requires action. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32 says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Kindness requires that action. And before we get to kindness, there are things that we have to get rid of. We have to get rid of stuff in order so that kindness can, can overflow. Bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slander. That stuff, it blocks kindness. I think that would be a, a pretty good exercise for all of us to do this week is to ask ourselves, what needs to go from my life so that kindness can be a constant reality in my life? What needs to go from my life so that kindness can be a constant reality in my life. What's blocking out the kindness in your life? Another way to ask it is, what's, what's, what's sucking the kindness right out of your life? The four of us from staff went down to Houston on Thursday to deliver the, all the supplies and donations that you guys gave, and, and the trailer was, was packed. I mean, it was packed. Even uh, we had several members come and repack it, uh, and then we had more donations after that. So, I mean, it was, it was completely and totally full. It was so heavy, and, and uh, we, we used my pickup to go, and I, I, just in horror, as we're driving down Houston, I literally saw my, the, the, the needle on my gas just do this. I've never seen it move before, right? You just kind of notice it, but I've, I've never seen it do, do that before, and, and, and so it's just, it, it was crazy, and, and for some of us, there are things that in our life that it just drains our kindness. I mean, it just literally takes it away. We, it, it's, some, it's our anger. It's our bitterness. It's our fear. Uh, maybe it's because uh, we're, we're tired or we're selfish or we're jealous or we feel slighted. And all of those things, it, it's like a trailer that's hitched to you and it's just drawing from your spirit. And, it is take, and those things are keeping you from caring. They are keeping you from being kind. 1 John 3, 18 says, dear, dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Did you hear that? Let's not just say it. Let's show it to one another with our actions. We can, we can say what we want, but just because we say it doesn't mean that it's true. I can tell you that I am a master electrician, but when I almost kill myself trying to change the electrical cord on a washing machine because I forgot to kill the power to the washroom, and then it pops really loud when I, when I plug it in and almost burns a hole through my shirt, well, that's the truth. That really happened to me, and it scared me to death because I'm an idiot. 
That's the truth. I'm an idiot. I'm not a master electrician. And I obviously don't have a lot of common sense. Common sense would have said, hey, shut the power off. But I didn't do that. The truth comes, the truth of who we are really comes when our words are followed with our actions. We need to show each other and show the world the love and kindness that comes from Jesus Christ. You know why these are called fruit of the Spirit? Because they're not fruit of ourselves. They're not called the fruit of Jimmy. They're called the fruit of the Spirit. They don't come naturally to us. These come from a relationship with Jesus Christ. They're a result of His power in our lives. Kindness means that, that we act. It's something that has, has been cultivated in us. And it comes from that relationship with Him. And the last thing, the roof over the whole building is this. Kindness is all for the sake of the gospel. Christopher J. H. Reich said, The quality of self-denying kindness is not only what it means to be Christ-like, it is also deeply attractive to others because it bears witness to the one who lives within us and whose spirit is bearing fruit in our lives. He goes on to say, The end result of kindness is that it draws people to Christ. Ephesians 5, in your bulletin, it actually says 520, and that was my mistake. It's Ephesians 515. It says this, therefore, be very careful how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Our actions are either pointing people to Christ or they're, they're pointing away from him. Kindness is a huge, biblical kindness is a huge directional sign that points people to God's goodness, to God's love, to God's grace, to God's mercy. Kindness opens doors that otherwise would be closed to us. It's, it's actually the first step, if you've been a part of it, the, the great commission strategy that, that we use, it's, it's actually the first step. We start with care. We start with kindness. That's, that's our first step. We simply ask people, how can we pray for you? How can we pray for you? We tell them that, that we're, we're, we come from a church in our community, we love our community, we care about our community, and we want to pray for the people and their needs. And you know what? More often than not, because I know most people think, oh, wow, they, they would shut the door in your face. But more often than not, people respond. Why? Because nobody does that. Nobody else, nobody else does that. We're all busy going about our day, and we're not stopping to take a moment to check on someone else. I did it the other day at Walmart. I asked the cashier, how can I pray for her? Because we, we were checking out with, with a lot of stuff that was actually going to Houston. And, and I just said, hey, how can I pray for her? And, and, and I think, I mean, it looked like she was about to cry. And she started telling me about her family who had just moved to Houston, maybe a couple of months earlier before the hurricane, and now they've lost everything. And I don't say that, I'm not saying that to, to, to brag at all. I'm just saying that as an illustration. You need to come to the Great Commission training, and, and that's where you'll hear story after story of how kindness, kindness opened the door to the gospel. We forget, here's the thing, we forget that people are in need. Because where we live, it looks like everything is good, and everybody is okay. But nothing, nothing can be further from the truth, even in this room. Even in this room, there are people who need our kindness, who need love, who need someone to care about them. Isn't it amazing how lonely you can be even when you're in a crowded room like this? Kindness paves the way to the gospel. Romans 2, 4 says, don't you realize how patient he is being with you? Or don't you care? Can't you see that he's been waiting all this time without punishing you to give you time to turn from your sin? His kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. The more we are aware of God's goodness, the more, the more that we're aware of His goodness, the more that we're drawn to Him. Why? Because the more aware we are of God's goodness, the more aware we are of our sin and our rebellion. We know that our sin and rebellion deserve punishment, separation from God. We see our present realities and, and, and we should run to the Savior. His goodness, in stark con contrast to our sinfulness, leads us to come to him. You see, when the world sees biblical kindness, it draws them to God. It, 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 will, draw them, it will draw them to you, and, and in turn, we can help point them to God because it is so contrary. 
Biblical kindness is so contrary to what the rest of the world is doing or saying. I read a book called Cultivating the Fruit of the Spirit, and the author says that there's, there's a Hebrew word. It's called hesed. And one of the older ways that hesed was translated was loving kindness. So when God acts in kindness, in hesed, it means God is being faithful to his covenant promises, paying careful attention to our needs, acting in generous and merciful love, generously providing everything for our blessing and benefit. You see, biblical kindness is so not about who we are because if you read the fruit of the Spirit, I said, but, remember when we read it first, it said, but the fruit of the Spirit, you read earlier in the chapter, it gives a list of all the things that are contrary to the Spirit. But you see, kindness is contrary to, to, to our sinful nature, contrary to our sinful world because it looks out for the benefit of others. That's God, that is God's kindness. It's a kindness that we should show to the world and it can only come from God's spirit living in us. It's fruit of the spirit, not the fruit of me and you. And how do you build that life of kindness? It's right there in front of you. You build on the foundation of Jesus, remembering that it's his kindness. He went first, asking him to remind us that, that of, of his kindness towards us, helping us to have a new mindset that leads to action and understanding that we want to point people to God. Are you kind? Let me ask it a different way. Is there biblical kindness in you? 